When he was hired as Jets general manager back in 2013, hopes were high that John Idzik could help turn around a struggling franchise. Unfortunately, his era was short-lived and unsuccessful. Today, we look back on the John Idzik era on the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It is Monday, July 18th, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from gangreennation.com. Today, our episode is brought to you bet by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, as we go through the summer on our way to training camp, we're looking back at Jets history. We're trying to figure out how the Jets got to this point in time. Today, we're going to move on to the John Idzik era. Idzik was the Jets' general manager for only two years, from 2013 through 2014. His tenure with the team was very unsuccessful. My friend McGregor Wells is back joining me to talk about the John Idzik era. Let's jump into our discussion. After the 2012 season, the Jets fired general manager Mike Tannenbaum, and Woody Johnson led what can only be described as an interesting search. He hired a headhunter named Jed Hughes. He put a number of conditions on the job and he brought in Seattle Seahawks executive, John Idzik. Idzik only lasted two years with the Jets. His reputation in the fan base was very bad at the time. After two years, the Jets almost had to fire him. It was a very bizarre time in the team's history. Joining me again is my friend McGregor Wells from gangreennation.com. He's been my partner in this series, examining Jets GMs of the 21st century. McGregor, it's interesting because my view on Idzik has changed through the years since he was with the Jets. Not so much in my assessment of the caliber of his work, because I thought it was very bad at the time, and I still think his record is really bad, but... At the time, I kind of viewed him as this villain who was ruining the Jets. And now in retrospect, I almost feel bad for him. I feel like he went into a situation he just was not prepared for. I don't think he really understood what it was going to be like being a GM in the league, but especially being a GM of a team like the Jets, where you're dealing with all these unique circumstances, whether it's the fan base, whether it's the media, whether it's just the internal dysfunction within the organization. I feel looking back like, he never had a chance. Yeah, he had, he had a rough way to go in. I mean, he came in off of the – he was given a head coach that he maybe didn't want to have when Rex Ryan was still there. Usually you fire the both of them together at the same time, Rex Ryan and Mike Tannenbaum. Tannenbaum was gone. Rex stays. That's sort of an issue. Um, he's given a, a quarterback who is still there, Mark Sanchez, even though he's got a new quarterback, in Tito Smith, and that was sort of playing out. Um, and he's also following the best Jets era of – a long time, probably the previous 40 years. Um, so he's trying to live up to and bring back the team back to a, a level that it was, you know, it was hard to live up to. Two, two straight AFC championship games very recently. And now he's inherited this situation where the town is now degraded and the cap situation is a disaster. So how, how do you come into that situation and make it work in the short term? It really was not set up for, for, for success for John Lindsay. And I look at this situation now It was a really, it was a bad job the Jets were giving out. Now, as you mentioned, the cap situation was bad. The talent level was low. To some extent, you have to expect that, though. These jobs don't open up when the team's successful, typically. You're not not getting the New England job. Typically, if a team has an opening, it's because the old GM got fired and things are bad. It It was not a great situation to walk into, but you have to expect that. But there were two really big conditions put on this job that may have scared off better candidates. The first, as you mentioned, you had to keep the coach. You did not get to pick your own coach. Rex Ryan stayed. Rex Ryan was a very popular figure within the fan base. Even after two bad years, he had a lot of equity built up. And I feel like Woody Johnson just did not have the guts to fire Rex Ryan and deal with the backlash from the fan base. And at the time, my view was not so much. And I, I liked Rex. At the, I still like Rex. But at the time, I wasn't completely convinced Rex needed to be fired. But even I kind of saw the problem with this. And my take was always, leave Rex in place. 
if the new GM wants him, keep him. If not, then let him go. Because it's really important that you have a productive working relationship between your head coach and your general manager. The other condition that was put on the team, this was a ridiculous one. And everybody who says Woody Johnson not a meddlesome owner. Woody Johnson, from what we know, essentially decreed you had to trade Darrell Rivas, who was not only the best player on the team, but at the time, outside of J.J. Watt, probably the most valuable defensive player in the league. And his value was low because he was coming off an injury because Mike Tannenbaum had struck a deal with him that he was not going to be able, the team was not allowed to franchise him. He was in the, entering the last year of his contract. So you were, you were essentially walking onto a job where you had to give up your best player and you had no leverage. And I feel like looking back, these were the types of things that made it difficult for the Jets to sell this job because I feel, and I feel like this is kind of what led us on the road to getting a dick because lots of credible GMs are not going to like be interested in the job such as this. And ultimately what you get is you get a guy who wants to be a GM who probably could not get a GM job in a more stable place. Somebody who's not really qualified. I feel like if it wasn't Idzik, you'd kind of be in the same situation anyway. Yeah. You know, in retrospect, it, it may have been, uh, may have been a good idea for the judge to give their preferred GM candidates a Joe Douglas deal where it's like, yeah, we're giving you a really lousy situation, but we'll give you six years. So, you know, you're going to have time to, to clean everything up. And do things your way, um, and they didn't give John Nissing that deal, obviously, I'm, uh, and I, <laughs> I'm glad they didn't. But uh, but uh, it may have been the only way to get a really good candidate in there was to say, here's a ton of money and a long, long stretch you're going to have to clean everything up. That would be, the, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, the the other thing I mentioned this at the beginning is they brought in a headhunter named Jed Hughes to run the search, and you know if you follow sports, you know that sometimes the team will bring in a headhunter, and they they can. This, these search firms can perform valuable roles. Like they're especially adept at doing background checks. You know, something that may have turn up in a Google search. You may you make sure there's nothing that happened 40 years ago with a guy that it's going to be a problem. But Whitney Johnson kind of let him run the entire search. And this goes back to, I think, what one of the problems with Woody is. Woody doesn't know what he wants in the GM. He doesn't know the qualities that make a good GM. And I remember this one quote from Chet Hughes that made me laugh where he said, something to the effect of, well, I'm, uh, people know me in, in professional sports. So they get a call from me. I'm going to get a, re- I'm going to get a re- uh, reply. And I sit in there saying like, well, yeah, you're running a GM search for a professional football. <laughs> like you put me in charge of a GM search. I'm sure I'm going to get a reply. Yeah, absolutely. They're, those jobs don't come all that often. Awesome. So yeah, you're off on that job. You're going to reply. <laughs> And, you know, here's the thing about Idzik. When they hired him, I really did not have a great. I was looking back at what I wrote at the time, and I, 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 wrote, I, I talked about the candidates, my thoughts on them on the website. And Idzik, I wrote something, something along the lines of, I can't really get a sense of how good this guy is. Like all I know is that he's had a lot of different jobs in the NFL. But there's one thing that, like in retrospect, I can't get over is this was the same search firm that ran the Seahawks GM search a couple of years earlier. Itzik was in the building then. And listen, sometimes you don't have, you have a GM interview that's not publicized, but there is absolutely no indication that Seattle interviewed this guy when he was in the building. So my question has always been, you ran this, the search firm ran this Seattle search a couple of years earlier. Itzik's there. You don't even consider him. Why is he suddenly a great candidate for the Jets? Yeah, he always seemed like more of a just a, a bean counter. He's, he was a guy that was a cap guy to me, and I don't think he really had the broad skill set you needed to be a GM in the NFL. Um, you, you know, some people defend him and say he didn't get a chance, and to an extent that's true because two years can't tell you anything. Two years, you just have a bad two years, plus he had a terrible situation coming into it. And so let's say he had a t- terrible draft for two years. Some guys can have a really good draft after that. You just don't know. I don't think Isaac was one of those guys, but it's a possibility. He never got really a chance to extend that to see what he was like. So, so some of it's just chance, you know? I look at this though, and I did not realize this at the time, but now looking back on this, you know, Rex is still around. A lot of the front office that was there for Tannenbaum was still there. And in retrospect, it was almost like they really did not want to make any changes. They just wanted, they wanted to get rid of Tannenbaum and, the thing about scapegoats in the NFL is frequently when a guy gets scapegoated, 
they have a lot of responsibility for the problem. It's just not 100% of the responsibility. And looking back on this, I mean, Terry Bradway's, we were talking about Terry Bradway sticking around forever. After, after Tannenbaum gets fired, Terry Bradway's still there. A lot of the key people in the scouting department stay. So I feel like looking back in hindsight, they did not really want to make change. They wanted to bring in somebody who was not going to make big changes, the big changes that needed to be made. Yeah, it's kind of a bizarre approach because you can see how bad the situation was for the Jets. To, to bring in someone who you, who you don't want to make big changes, what, I mean, why would you do that considering what we have to work with here? The Jets didn't have a lot to work with. You have to make some big changes there. They may not be good changes in the long run, but you got to take a shot. And like part, I, I've always, I've been talking about the theory behind the higher at the beginning of these shows, you know, Itzik was the guy who was brought in to restore order, but he was also, there were a couple of people in Seattle who said that he was their secret weapon. And Seattle had this sequence of great drafts between 2010 and 2012, where they, you know, they picked Russell Okun, they picked Russell Wilson, Bobby Wagner, Richard Sherman, uh, Earl Thomas, uh, Cam Chancellor was in. So they had a lot of great drafts and some people referred to him as the, the Seattle secret weapon, which in retrospect, he probably was not. But the, thing, the other thing that was odd to me was the Jets are, okay, the Jets bring this guy in. He's the Seattle secret weapon. I don't think he ever brought in somebody from the Seattle scouting department to work in the Jets front office. <laughs> no, I don't think he did either. Um, he brought in uh, Reno Giacomini though. So that was something from Seattle. <laughs> that was great. That was a great move. Um, I just, rem- and I remember going back to this, his introductory press conference and I probably overreacted because I, I think inter- introductory press conferences are meaningless. Sometimes you'll get a guy says something that so he says something and it, it doesn't pan out at all. But I remember being struck by it. He went in there and he pretty much just talked about how great everybody was. And he said, well, I don't sense any dysfunction. This is after the Tebow year where circus was the word of the year with the jets and the media. And he goes in and he goes, we have a lot of great people. Here. And listen, I understand you're the new boss there. You don't want to, but, I feel like there's kind of a balance you can see. You don't have to go in there and say everybody's going to be fired, but <laughs> obviously you're there. You just got hired because things are not great. And he kind of left me with the impression in that intro. And I'm probably overstating it, but he left me with the, the, the impression of the introductory press conference. Like, Hey, everything's good here. No, I just think he suffered from a lack of urgency. And that, that played through throughout his whole tenure that uh, he just, uh, well, in, it may mean nothing, but during his two-year tenure, you know, there's 32 GMs. 31 of them made a draft day trade. The one that didn't was it. <laughs> and, um, I mean, it, it just seemed like he was so deliberate in his approach to everything that he just couldn't function in such a high-pressure environment. That's, that's why I saw it anyway. And that goes back to my thoughts on Idzik in hindsight, I feel like he's a guy, he's a guy who clearly a lot of people in the league respect, and he's been a good front office guy in lesser roles. I just think he kind of misinterpreted what the GM job was, where he thought he's just, it's just going to be like a regular office. We're going to work here. I remember years ago, maybe nine, 10 years ago, Scott Pioli, who was the chief's GM and he worked in the Patriots and Falcons front offices. He wrote this article for sports illustrated. And he talked about how when you're the GM, you don't really get to do the stuff you love. You don't really get to do the football stuff. And Pioli talked about how he said to spend like four hours this one day doing PR because one of his players sent out an offensive tweet. And it's like nothing like the stuff that like drew you to the game. And I think about its tenure and it's like really did not embrace being the public face of the, of the franchise. And listen, when you're the GM, you got to work with the media a little bit. You have to like be able to convey your plan. It's like never really, imp- you have to form some sort of relationship with the media because the fans need to understand what you're doing. And I, to this day, I still don't really understand what his plan was. And he did not communicate. And I'll tell you this, like, this is something I found out. Um, even like softball stuff, he, he would, there, there would be opportunities where he'd be, he could be interviewed by team employees. It just get, it, this would be, this was not like a high pressure press environment this was not a high pressure press conference with the beat writers who are out to make you look bad he wouldn't even do like the stuff that was like really simple where he was not going to face any tough questions he just really did not embrace being the face of the franchise yeah i I, he was he was like a deer in the headlights sometimes he just and i just i mean people sometimes give him credit for 
clearing out the cap space, because which had to be done. But I mean, when, when you look at the moves he made to do that, you could go on to Gangry Nation and there were 10 people saying these moves were going to make this up. I mean, there, there was no brilliant strategy there. there Literally, like there, were, ar there were articles written, it may have been by you, like whoever the GM is going to make these obvious moves to clear right. out the cap. Exactly. Exactly. Everyone knew these moves were going to be made. So I don't see how you give the, that guy a lot of credit for making moves that we were all writing about at the time. I mean, these, these were horrible contracts. Made. Everybody, these were the right. bad Tannenbaum contracts right. that they finally had the chance to clear out. Right. And then, so what do you do after that? After you clear out cast space, and going back to his deliberate approach, you know, he had a kind of a bad, I mean, he had a first year, it was eight and eight, but it was a really deceptive eight and eight. That was a bad team. The next year, in 2014, He's got a, a second-year quarterback who was struggled the first year. He needed to support him, and he brings in Eric Decker, and then he just kind of, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I, in, in free agency, I'm done. He goes to the draft. He just drafts nobody. In One of the best receiver season. drafts in history. Right, and he drafts nobody. I mean, he drafts Jalen Saunders and, and Shaq, mate, Shaq, whatever. Shaq, Shaq Evans. Evans. Um, you know, the fourth round and the sixth round, I mean, and, and these guys had no chance. They were never going to be anything in the NFL. I mean, and that's that's how you support your young quarter. It just seemed like he just what was I don't get the plan. There was no plan. He didn't know what he was doing. Of course, now with Joe Douglas as the Jets general manager, we're hoping that the team will win more games than they did under John Idzik or his immediate successor, Mike McCagnan. And you should know that if you want to bet on the Jets this, cup, this upcoming season, betonline.net is your number one source. It's your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info, not just for the Jets. You can find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, eSports, and scores. For the Major League Baseball season and the upcoming seasons for the NFL and other sports, BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your scores, podcasts, and news. And BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check on all of your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet online, where the game starts. Let's talk about this 2013 season and let's begin. The free agency was very quiet because the Jets really, did, the aforementioned lack of cap space that year because they were clearing the bad contracts off the book. You go to the 2013 draft and they trade Revis the week before the draft. And this was an era, again, this was a, this is part of why it was a bad job. This was an era where on top of everything else, where Revis is entering his contract here, you can't franchise him. He's coming off a knee injury, so his value is low. This is right after the rookie wage scale comes into play. And there was a stretch from like 2011 through, I'd say 28. I think the Khalil Mack trade is kind of what changed everything. But teams just were not giving up draft picks for players. So the Jets only get a first round pick and a conditional three, which ends up being a four for Revis. So they enter this draft with two first round picks. The first pick, they picked D. Milner out of Alabama, the corner, and I hated that because I always hate it when you trade a player who's great and then you draft his replacement, hoping he'll be as good as the play. I just hate those moves. The second pick is Sheldon Richardson, who I, everybody, hate. I hated the pick. I killed the pick at the time. Ended up being his best draft pick of, of, of all of them in the two years, I think. Then the second round, he drafts Geno Smith, the quarterback out of West Virginia. It, it doesn't really work out. I, I'll always defend the pick. I, I, I think that was the right spot for if you're going to roll the dice. He could have picked him at nine. He could have picked him at 13 in the first round. He held off. The quarterback you have questions on, but you like his upside. I feel like the second round, that's a good spot to kind of roll the dice. But part of it's that you're not really making a big commitment to Geno Smith by picking him in the second round. Yet it seems like Idzik was totally committed to Geno Smith, even after a rookie year where I know the team, the argument's always the team went eight and eight. The team did not really go eight and eight because Geno Smith was playing well. It was a very rocky year. And yet Idzik seemed completely committed to Geno Smith. And I still can't figure that one out. No, being committed to, I mean, that, that was a, that was a really rough year for Geno Smith in his rookie year. But, but again, they, they didn't have anybody around him. They, their weapons that were just disastrous. And, you know, when you see that happen, you say, okay, what can we do to help this quarterback in the second year? And then, Sign Eric, Eric Decker. All right, we're good. And oh, we got, we brought Brino. We brought Brino in. So that's pretty good. I mean, and, and it wasn't like he was out of cap space. They, they had the most cap space in the league at the end of the year, at the end of the free agent uh, process. And they just sat there. And, just, and what, what are you saving this cap space for? You're trying to develop your young quarterback. Help him, you know? It's like, no, we're good. <laughs> 
I'm going to say, I think that when you have a year like Geno Smith had his rookie year and you only use the second round pick on him, I'm not saying you get rid of him. And I'm saying, you know, maybe either, maybe we just can't find a new quarterback this off. We'll have Geno Smith around, but that's different from me saying I'm going all in with this kid. To me, that's di- maybe it just works out that we can't find another young, we can't find, we can't draft anybody else, but it seems like he was again. Now in fairness in 14, it's debatable. Would you want Derek Carr? I think Teddy Bridgewater's career goes differently if he doesn't get her. I think Teddy, but it seemed like that was never an option. But I go back to, I'll go back to 2013 for a little bit. Cause you mentioned that they went eight and eight and it was a fluky eight and eight. The team was, but this was another year, like, like 2006 when the Jets were supposed to be the worst team in the league. They surprised everybody. They weren't as good as they were in 06. They didn't make the playoffs, but it wasn't because the team was, it still was a really bad team. They just got lucky in a lot of, Opening day, I was at the game. They played Tampa Bay. They essentially the game is lost, and then they get a fluke fifteen yard penalty because uh, a Tampa Bay linebacker hits Geno Smith late out of bounds and puts them in field goal range. There's a game against New England. They're in overtime, and Nick Folk misses a field goal, and the Patriots line up uh, in an illegal defensive formation because they line up somebody over the long snapper, so they get a second chance. It was. They, they had, a, I think there was something like five and one in one score games that year. And then when they lost, they got blown out. So I've always wondered that off season, did they think they were closer than they really were? Did they think, well, we're eight and eight, maybe, maybe that was it. Yeah. I, I, I can't understand it. They, 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 I, I, I said at the time that that eight and eight was completely deceptive because that eight and eight team actually was the, um, had the worst uh, point differential in NFL history for any team that was 500 or better. In NFL history, that that was a terrible team that just walked out for it. You know, these things sometimes happen. You get lucky breaks, you get lucky bounces. Instead of being, you know, five and eleven, you get eight and eight. But that that's it was not an eight and eight kind of team. I mean, they they were bad. But and you mentioned one of the positions where they whiffed, where wide receiver they had pretty much nobody. I mean, they I guess they had Jeremy Curley coming back. Who come on? <laughs> Jeremy Curley's like a third or a third receiver at best, and is prime for maybe a fourth receiver. And that the entire offseason, all they get is Eric Decker, but just as glaring as the corner position where they entered the offseason, Antonio Cromartie, I think, had to be cut because he had an awful year. He was a cap, he was a cap casualty. D Milner really struggled. D Milner finished his rookie year strong. He had a couple of good games against Cleveland and Miami, but really struggled that year. They needed a corner. And as you mentioned, ton of cap space really good free agent corner class that there were lots of guys who ended up being good corners. They end up with Dimitri Patterson. And I think they, they draft Dexter McDougal in the third round, which that was a pick I hated at the time. And he did nothing with, with the team. So I look at this, you had the two, the two core needs you had in the off season, corner and receiver. You had a great free agent corner class. You had a historic receiver draft. Now in fairness, some of the receivers were off the board with the point where the Jets picked, but you come out of that offseason with Eric Decker at receiver and Dimitri Patterson and Dexter McDougal at corner. And Dimitri never played it down for the Jets. Dimitri never played it down with the Jets. He disappeared on the team in preseason. Yep. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and Rex Ryan needs corners. And mm-hmm. this plays, and uh, I think another part of the problem with going eight and eight is in retrospect, it saved Rex's job because there's no way they could get rid of Rex after he finishes eight and eight when they're expected to be the worst. They just never meshed. It's like in Rex never meshed. And I, you got the feeling from Rex's comments after the fact that he kind of felt like the way it's approached that off season, Rex knows that my job's on the line in 2014. It's not backing me. So Rex does stuff. He puts, he takes the safety Antonio Allen, who's a run. St- he's an awful cover safety. He puts him at corner. And that was almost, to me, a situation where I, I viewed it as Rex was like tr- kind of setting himself up for job interviews the next year, saying, well, what was I supposed to do? I had to play Antonio Allen at corner. That's what Inzik left me a corner. <laughs> Antonio Allen. And wasn't Darren Wallace opposite him that, that year? Yes, he was. Yes, that, he was. Yeah, that was, that was a brilliant <laughs> quarterback duo. <laughs> what, what talent that team had, huh? <laughs> and he, the thing about that is like, if you look at the, this is one of those things that's going to be lost in history, because if you look at the numbers, statistically, they weren't that bad, but if you were watching that, you knew what an issue corner was with that team. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, uh, the, the, the town, 
and the thing is that he, he, we had the resources to bring in more talent and he just, he sat there and it's like, what are you rolling this, ta- this cap space over for? What are you waiting for? It's like, okay, they're not going to be the best team in the league. Are you only going to spend your cap space when they're ready for a Super Bowl? Or that, who does this? I mean, you try to improve your talent. You get young guys instead of older guys, right? Well, no, we waited until we were one in six that year, I think, because yes. that was the point mm-hmm. where the Jets made the trade for Percy Harvin, which again, I think they were, I want to say they were one in six. It was the day after they lost Thursday night to the Patriots. The Jets traded for Percy Harvin at one in six. And it was at the time that it was kind of like, I was kind of like, well, hey, they got a playmaker finally. But then the more you think about it, Percy Harvin's coming from Seattle. That team's gearing up for, they won the Super Bowl the year before. They're gearing up for a second run. And they're just sending you this guy for a day three pick. Something about that doesn't add up. Yeah. I, I never was in favor of that trade. I was like, what, why are you doing this now? This makes no sense. You're done for this year. And this guy was never a guy. That, yes, he was sometimes a playmaker. But he was the kind of guy you had to feed the ball to. You had to stretch your whole offense around him to sort of uh, manufacture touches for him. That's a gadget guy. That is not a guy that's going to carry a passing game. And uh, he ended up being kind of a disaster for the Jets. And what, it was not a surprise to me at all. Very well said. And one of the rationales people gave at that point in time was, well, now we have another receiver so we can get a proper evaluation of Gino. And the point that I was, that I made was exactly what you said. He's, this isn't a guy who's going to run routes and Gino's going to find him in the progression. He's a guy you're going to throw screens to and you know, get him out the ball on sweeps. He's a space player. He's not the type of guy you want to evaluate your young quarterback. And right. to me, this is where the whole plan just kind of fell apart because Prior to this point, I thought it was he should have done more. And I, I'm not a big spending free agency guy, but there were core needs that could have been addressed in free agency that year. And he just ignored them. And I feel like part of it, you you mentioned it, he's a very deliberative guy. The rumor was always that they were going to try and get Monte Davis from the Colts, and Davis re-signed with the Colts on the eve of free agency. And it was like there was no plan B. And I wonder what, you know, maybe the same thing happened at the receiver position. There would it seemed like there was no plan after Decker. He wasn't good. Thinking, I, I don't know if thinking on his feet's the right way, but he was not good adjusting to events as adaptations were required. It was no, I think I think that's what reflects in the fact that he's the only GM that didn't make a, a draft day trade, the only one in the league in those two years. I mean, I think I think it was clear this guy could not work in a high pressure environment. He needed time to step back and think things through, and you know, <laughs> it just doesn't work sometimes. Sometimes in that position, you got to be boom. I got to make an adjustment. I got to. Yeah, and the one who just made was, was Percy Harvin. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> and that was where that was where he he had lost me before this point because Dimitri Patterson, the corner group was in shambles. A, a coach who needs corners for his system in Rex. But I, I thought, like, okay, I guess he's thinking of the future here. He's not really building this year. But then you're trading for an expensive receiver at one and six. How does that right. make any sense? You're giving up a draft, not a good draft pick, but still a draft pick for an expensive receiver when you're one in six. And this is where I just don't understand what the plan is here. That was the moment when it was clear he had no vision. That was it right there. It's, it's clear he, he was just in over his head. There was no vision. There was no overall plan. He just, he just was reacting at that point to, I'm going to get fired at the end of the year if I don't do something to turn this around. That was, it was self press It was 100% yeah. self-preservation. That, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. But then just lose a couple more games. And I, I don't think we could discuss it. It's, completely unless we talk about the midseason press conference which it was after a horrific loss to buffalo uh, where geno smith threw i think three interceptions his first eight pass out of the bench immediately and he gets out there for his midseason press conference he begins and i remember listening to this it was in the after i think it was the monday afternoon after the buffalo game he starts off saying you know what we're doing is this is unacceptable and i'm like okay fine you're never going to come off good when your team's whatever it was one in seven there's nothing you can say that's going to leave you. But then he starts going on about, after he talks about how unacceptable this is, I, I can't do it justice, but he, he starts talking about how we're working really hard. I'm like, this is the NFL. You're judged on wins and law. He's like, we're coming so close. He's talking about like the effort we showed in a game in San Diego, which was one of the, it was one of the, that was a game I distinctly remember the game in San Diego that year, because I remember that I said that was at the time, which has unfortunately since been surpassed. That was the closest I've seen the Jets looking like the Kotite teams since the Kotite teams themselves. 
Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that was really a bad time for the Jets. <clears throat> And then that that led to uh, that led to the billboards that went up. <laughs> Somebody put a, there was some group that like put up a bunch of billboards. Fire John Idzik, which I I thought the most hilarious part of that was there was this group of fans that was really outraged over the billboards, saying, "Why can't you use that money for a, for a productive venture?" <laughs> and I was, well, I mean. You could you say that about anything. You could say that about you could, the football buying Jets tickets isn't really that for you could take the money you're give, giving for Jets tickets and give it to charity. So I, I I always thought it was hilarious, like how outraged people got over this billboard. And I feel like we as fans like to we like to imagine we're more important than we really are. Because another one of the arguments these people made was, how are we going to get a coach or GM here if we're putting up billboards. They're going to see that these fans put up billboards. And I've never heard no. of a coach or GM who the coaches and GMs that care about the ownership you've got, the roster you've got, what are my chances of success? What's the salary cap situation? Maybe what's the city? You know, how, do I like the city you're living in? Nobody's going to turn down a job interview because a couple of fans put up some bill. It, listen, it's, they know the New York, New York fans are intense. If you're trying to like use that angle, they know New York fans are intense. And anybody who's afraid of New York, it's not having a billboard up's not going to be. But I, was, I thought that was the funniest thing. How like people like got so angry over the billboards. Oh, it's ridiculous. You come into this job and you're not thinking, well, what, what if I do something really terrible and they put up a billboard? I mean, you're coming and thinking, how am I going to make this team good? You know, you're not thinking, what happens when I crash, right? If you're thinking that when you're coming to, to take the job, you're the wrong guy for the job. And Listen, I, people people act like that guy. I don't think that. Listen, I understand being frustrated to the point where you feel like you got to do something. So I'm not casting aspersions on anybody who posted the billboards. I don't think the billboards mattered. Listen, I, I know some people at the Jets. They understood that fans were very on to the extent fans unhappiness played a role in the decision. They understood the depth of fan unhappiness before the billboards. But we moved to the end of the season. Jets win a couple of meaningless games and. It's a it goes. It's he only gets two years, but I look back on it. He just he, it was never going to work because they were never going to get a guy who need. I go back to what I said at the beginning. They did not want to make changes. They wanted Rex to stay. They wanted the same people in the front office. They were never going to hire a guy who was going to make the wholesale changes that were necessary. That's that's my take on the Idzik era, and I I almost feel bad for him because he walked in here. I don't think he understood what he was what was going to happen. I don't think he understood the the inner workings of working as a general manager, but I also feel like he really did not understand the nuances of the New York Jets at that time where they had a coach who had a very loyal following in the media. I'm sure Rex was I'm sure some of these stories were because Rex was unhappy. You know, Rex was feeding stuff to to get people in the I, I don't know this for a fact, so you know, don't quote me on this, but I have to imagine Rex was very close with many members of the media. He was very frustrated that year. If you were in Rex's shoes, you, you might be too. I'm sure he, he was, there were lots of internal politics he did not get. Um, really did not understand the, the public role as the GM working with the media. And again, that was something that maybe could have bought him. A, it, you'll never save your job if you don't win. But if you put together a rationale and you have people in the media trying to explain it to the fan base. I feel like it could buy you a little bit of time. It's just never embraced that part of it. It just was, I, I to this day, I, I, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. My view on him as being the problem has evolved. I don't think he, I think he was a symptom, not the problem, but my view on whether he was going to be successful if you gave him more time, I just don't think it was going to happen. He was not the right guy for the team. I don't think he was the right guy to be. I think he's a great guy. If you want somebody who's going to be uh, competent for what he does in the front office, again, you speak to people in the league. John Idzik's got a good reputation for what he does, but he's just not the guy to run the, the whole operation. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I always think that that GMs are not given enough time to actually prove themselves because when you look at the biggest part of their job is, is, is mastering the draft. That's the most important part, especially with the rookie wage scale in place. And if you only give them three or four years, well, their first two drafts aren't really, you know, seasoned yet by the end of those. So you, you're, you're judging them on things that, a lot of stuff that happened before they even got here. So to me, it was always like, you know, if you're going to get a GM here, you got to really give them enough time to see what he can be. But John Isaac was an exception to that rule. I don't think John Isaac was ever 
up to any part of this job. I just think he was not the right guy for the position or any GM position, not just for the Jets, any team. I don't, th- I don't think he was up for the job. And he had that, you know, that 12 player draft class where Quincy Inunua was really the only guy who was useful. For, and I do think it's a little overstated that that 2014 draft class, the Idzik 12, because this was not like Joe Douglas's draft class this year where they had all these, you know, first and second round picks where the, almost all of their picks were day three picks that nine of the 12 picks that year were day three picks. So it wasn't, I think that that, I, I always felt like that got accentuated because of how little he did in free agency. I felt like in 2014, it was one of those things where we didn't do much in free agency. Oh, we have 12 draft picks. That'll fix everything. So to an extent, I think it's a little overstated, but still like Calvin Pryor, Jason Morrow, Dexter McDougal, no receivers in a great receiver class until the fourth round when you really need a receiver. It's tough to defend. It's very tough to defend. Yeah, they, they that draft class was a complete disaster. And again, you know, even good GMs have disastrous drafts. And so it's possible that if you gave him more time, he'd, he'd be better in the draft. But I, I don't think, I, I think this guy was just sitting over his head. The problem though, is that you had the same schedule. As I mentioned, you did not really make wholesale changes to the scouting staff. So it was kind of right. a continuation of what was going wrong with Tannenbaum. Right. Yep. All right. Well, it's been great doing this with you. I guess on this journey, the next guy we'll be talking about, I wish it was getting happier. I wish we would de- depress our listeners less, but we're going to have to move on to Mike McCagnan next. So I'll speak with you next about the great Mike McCagnan. Oh, I really look forward to this one. <laughs> this will be fun. <laughs> Well, that's all for our show today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I know it's tough to talk about the Idzik era. We are getting closer to the optimism that will come with the Joe Douglas era, but that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. As always, if you enjoyed the show, hit that subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, please give the episode a big thumbs up. It helps the channel out and it helps other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Until next time, have a great day, and we will be back to chat about the Mike McCagnan era.